Gospel of Isaiah, the Old Testament Gospel. Isaiah chapter number 9, Isaiah chapter number 9. As you're turning, I uh, want to share a, a couple of announcements. We're going to have a, a security meeting on Sunday evening, January, this, January the 7th at 4 o'clock. Uh, a security meeting. All those that are on the security team, we are looking for volunteers as well, more security personnel, parking lot patrol. Uh, if you can come to that meeting on Sunday evening, January the 7th at 4 o'clock, we would uh, appreciate you being there. We're getting up some new guidelines, uh, beefing up security for the safety of uh, our church family. And so if you could be there on Sunday evening, January the 7th, uh, you'll, we'll tell you where we're going to meet uh, a little later on, and, uh, and, and so we'll, we'll get together there and we'll share some, some uh, vital information of what we need to do going forward. And then Brother Greg has put some Christmas tracks uh, over in our track racks, and make sure that you grab some of these during the Christmas season, and uh, you can stick them in your, your mail as you mail in a bill. You can uh, leave them at a, with a good, good tip, amen? With a good tip, you can leave them at, uh, at uh, your uh, table at a restaurant. Now listen, if you're going leave to leave a track, you better leave a tip. Uh, these don't have Blue Ridge View on the back of them, thank goodness. But, but uh, don't leave a track if you're not going to leave a tip. And just, just, just by the way, you know, uh, tip now is somewhere around 15 to 20%. And uh, I believe we ought to be good to our waiters and our waitresses. That's just a plug right there. And uh, by the way, uh, the tithe is still, still 10%, amen? <laughs> All right, Isaiah chapter number 9. Isaiah chapter number 9. I want to speak to you. And there are not, probably not uh, two messages that I've been more excited about than the one I preached this morning and uh, the one that I'm going to share this evening as we get into the Christmas season. And uh, I just want to share very briefly tonight a very, very familiar passage of Scripture. But uh, I want to speak to you tonight, tonight on this subject. What child is this? Or who is this child? Stand with me in honor and in reverence to the reading of God's inspired word. The Bible says in Isaiah 9, beginning in verse 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name, I love this, shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice. From henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. What child is this? Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for looking around, seeing this great-looking Sunday night crowd. Lord, I pray in the next few moments that, Lord, we would clear our minds from anything that would distract us from seeing you tonight in this message. Lord Jesus, I pray that we would be encouraged tonight from the message to know just who you are. Lord, what you've come to do. And then, Lord Jesus, may we do something about it in our own lives. So Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of it. I thank you that it is up to date and it is contemporary. Lord Jesus, that we can apply it even now in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You know, we need to ask ourselves uh, during this time uh, of year, during the Christmas season, we need to ask ourselves, why am I celebrating? Why are we coming together as families? Why do we come together as a church and have Christmas parties and Sunday school parties? Just, just why are we celebrating? Am I celebrating a, a holiday? Or are we, in fact, celebrating a holy day? Am I celebrating a season? Or do we get together and truly celebrate a Savior? What takes center stage during the Christmas season in your life? I, I, I wonder how cognizant of the fact uh, we are of the fact that the joy of this season 
is all because of Jesus Christ. How, how conscious are we of the fact that the songs that we sing in large part are because of Jesus Christ? The love that we're supposed to have this time of year, the cheer and the joy and the merriness, it's all because of this little baby born in Bethlehem. The Bible says in John chapter 14, you, you know the scripture, Jesus said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And, and I'm going to come again. I'll receive you unto myself to take you there where I am. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You can't come to me except through the Father. Listen, do you realize that the inheritance of the child of God, that future reward, that future rest, is all because of the incarnation of Almighty God? It's all because of the birth of Jesus. The blessings that are bestowed upon the child of God are all because of of a lowly birth of a divine baby over 2,000 years ago in a humble stable. The central figure throughout the scriptures is the conquering Christ. In the Old Testament era, through the, through the Passover, the people looked forward to redemption. In the New Testament era, during the Christmas season, we look backward to the incarnation. In the book of Isaiah, the centrality of Christ is vividly seen for us. Now, it's interesting to note, and I, I find this very interesting, and so I want you to listen, and maybe you didn't know this, uh, I didn't. It's interesting that there are as many chapters in Isaiah as there are books in the whole Bible. Uh, these books divide into 39 and 27, as do the books in the Old Testament and New Testaments. The tone of the first 39 chapters of Isaiah have an Old Testament bent while the remaining chapters point us to the truth of the New Testament. The last 27 chapters divided into three sections. They each contain nine, ch nine chapters. Isaiah in his center division deals with the Messiah. Of the nine chapters in the Messiah section, the center chapter, chapter 53, you and I know as uh, uh, the suffering servant chapter, it gives us the clearest view of Calvary, the clearest revelation of the one to be born who would take away the sin of the world. It's the clearest uh, uh, portrait or portrayal in the Old Testament of the coming Christ found in Scripture. How divinely logic that the name Isaiah means salvation of Jehovah. If you were to do an in-depth study of this book, you would hear the, the dreaded proclamations of a powerful prophet. One chapter you would visualize doom and you would visualize gloom and you would see judgment and you would hear hard preaching. And then Isaiah would shift his focus from doom and gloom and he goes to light. And to might. He writes about the Messiah as the Savior and Sovereign to illustrate the crown, the coronation, the cross. The songwriter asked many years ago, and we sing it sometimes at Christmas. What child is this? Well, in the pages of this prophetic book, Isaiah tells us just what child this is. He tells us what child is coming. The baby born in Bethlehem, the Bible says, is a lamb and a lion. He's the lamb of God slain for the sin of the world. Yet he's the lion of the tribe of Judah who will one day, the Bible says, rule and reign over his kingdom. This child is he whom we turn our attention to during the Christmas season. It's the one that we need to give our lives to and follow His leadership in our life. Not just during the Christmas season, but in everyday life. What does Isaiah say about this child? What child is this? What about this son? What about this baby? Well, first of all, right from the text, he is wonderful. He is wonderful. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, Beloved, there are a thousand things in this world that are called by names that do not belong to them. But in entering upon my text, I must announce at the very opening that Christ is called wonderful because He is so. Amen? <laughs> he is wonderful. Wonderful in His identity. 
He's wonderful in his identity. Friend, you can preach on the virgin birth. You can analyze the incarnation. You can listen to sermons about the advent. But when all is read, when all is studied and heard concerning God coming to this earth as a babe in a manger, you have to sit back and you have to say, he's wonderful. Wonderful in his identity. He's wonderful in his industry. Wonderful in his, in his work. His industry where? His work where? In creation. In creation, only a wonderful God with a wonderful mind and with wonderful power could conceive and create the majestic world that you and I live in. To see the beauty and the intricacy and the detail of man, beast, and earth. One has to say no to evolution and you have to say yes to a wonderful God. Amen? And listen, his work or his industry, not only in creation but in salvation, his greatest works are not the mountains and the sea. His greatest works are not the butterflies and the bees. His greatest work was redemption. His greatest work is saving a soul. You see, only a wonderful God could take a woeful man and turn him into a worthy citizen of heaven. Amen? Man, he's wonderful in creation, in salvation. He's wonderful in his work of ministry. All through the New Testament, you see the wonderful works of his miraculous power. We see him raising the dead. We see him feeding the multitudes. We, we see him giving sight to the blind. We see him in his ministry. He's touching the hurting. He's touching the hopeless and the despondent. But he's also wonderful in his destiny. This child was born to die. He was born to be the Savior of the world. When we look at that and we say, what child is this? One of the words that we use is, he's wonderful. But the second thing right from the text is this. What child is this? He's counselor. He is counselor. The scriptures state that Jesus is not just wonderful, but he's counselor. No doubt, no doubt now, Jesus has the answer to every question you may have, and he has the solution to every problem we may encounter. Matter of fact, if you're weary in mind tonight, Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. If, you're, if you need basic worldly goods, Jesus says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all these things shall be added unto you. What things, preacher? In the context of Christ's preaching, all those things, raiment and food, clothing, all of those worldly needs. If you're worried about life, Jesus said, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. If you want to be a lit witness to the lost, Jesus said, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me. If you're weak in body, Jesus says, rise, take up your bed and walk. If you're sad today, Jesus says, joy comes in the morning. If you're afraid of death, as we preach this morning, he says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. If you need an answer that is in his will to answer, he says, Call on me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things. He's wonderful. He's counselor for your worry. He has wisdom for your problem. He's got a plan for your discouragement. He has direction for your pain. There is a prescription. He has a purpose for every person, for every man. He has a message. I want you to think with me about the counsel he has for the sin. You know what he says to the sinner tonight? He says today is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the accepted time. Harden not your heart, he says. He says, whosoever shall call upon my name shall be saved. That's the counsel to the sinner. But he's also got counsel to the saint, to the saved. Listen, here's his counsel tonight. Listen very carefully. He says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not upon thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Preacher, I do not know which way to go. I've got a big decision to make. I don't know how I'm going to make it. I, I, I know that maybe this decision could alter the course of my life. I do not know what to do. Listen to me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he'll direct your path. Friend, this evening the Lord's counsel is like honey to the taste. It's like harmony to the ear, health to the body, happiness to the soul, hope to the heart. He's wonderful. He's counselor. What child is this? 
He's mighty God. He's mighty God. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called the mighty God. Did you know that the Bible teaches very clearly that Jesus is the God-man? He's the God-man. He was 100% man, 100% God. Jesus, at his birth there in Bethlehem, was as old as his heavenly father and ages older than his earthly mother. Now, that'll blow your mind. Amen? Before time began, Christ was. Jesus stepped out of eternity into time. He was born in Bethlehem. He was hidden in Egypt. He was raised in Nazareth. He was baptized in the Jordan. He was tempted in the wilderness. This child turned water into wine. He healed the sick. He gave sight to the blind. He forgave sin. He raised the dead. He fed the thousands. He charged nothing for every service that he ever gave. The Lord Jesus Christ conquered every foe that came against him. And ultimately the Bible says he took our sins up to Calvary and died for the world. He was buried in Joseph's tomb and right on schedule he arose out of the grave giving victory to all who would come to him. Amen? I like how the old black preacher put it. The black preacher said Christ dug deep the gorges piled up the hills and probed up the mountains with his will. The moon and the stars leaped off his arm. He did not have to write his signature on the corner of a sunrise because he's the creator. He did not have to place a laundry mark in the lapel of a meta because he's the owner. He did not have to carve his initials in the side of the mountain because he's the title holder. Jesus did not have to put a brand on the cattle of a thousand hills because he's the proprietor. He did not have to take out a copyright on the songs his birds sang because he's the author. Amen? He's wonderful. He's counselor. He's mighty God. You know the sociologist today is trying to change our world today by putting an old man in a new suit. They just say, you put an old man, you put him in a new environment, you put him around better surroundings, and he'll become a better man. No, my friend, that's not the way it works. The world does not need a change of environment. The world needs Jesus. And the mighty God, and only the mighty God, can transform you. He can put a new man in an old suit and change his life and those he comes into contact with. Amen? What child is this? He's wonderful. He's counselor. He's the mighty God. But number four, notice what Isaiah says. He's everlasting Father. You know what that means? This ought to bless you. Literally, Christ is Father until everlasting. He's Father until everlasting. That means that Christ will still be God after eternity begins. He'll be God long after this country and and the world lies in ruins somewhere. He'll still be God when our fleeting and vaporous life we now have is gone. He'll still be God when the stars leap at His command from their present orbit and the earth melts with fervent heat from the gaze of Him whose eyes, the Bible says, are like fire. He'll still be God after all of our questions and concerns are wonderfully resolved in a heavenly understanding. He'll still be God when all of our weaknesses become strong. He'll still be God after our defeats become victories. He'll still be God when our sunny eye sojourn through the wilderness of this life gives way to our view of eternity. He will still be God when every atheist, atheist, every agnostic, every unbeliever, every person who has denied God, he'll still be God when they're dead and when they're gone. Friend, he's wonderful. He is counselor. He's mighty God. He's everlasting father. But I like this one real good. What child is this? He's prince of peace. Tell you what, we live in a world that's looking for peace. We live in a world of anxiety, depression, despondency. The Bible says he's prince of peace and describes his domain in verse 7. That passage is prophetic because it will not be fully actualized until the millennium. During the millennial reign of Christ, our Savior will rule and reign over all the earth. The establishment of the domain will rest upon the Lord's shoulders. 
The extent of the kingdom is summed up in the words of Isaiah. There will be no end to the increase of his government of peace. Things are going to be different the next time the Lord sets foot on this earth. He will trade a donkey for a white stout. He will trade a crown or a cross for a crown. He will not stand before Pilate. Pilate will bow before him. He will trade rejection for reverence and humiliation for exaltation. You see, my friend, there is coming a day, the Word of God says, when he will make walking on water a mere formality. Amen? He will make the miracles that we see in the Word of God, he will make them a mere formality when he mounts that white horse and rides down the cloudy skies of the universe to this earth. The laws of gravity, the laws of time, the laws of space will simultaneously collapse and his children will be standing with him in honor and in power and in glory. The Word of God became flesh. The Son of God became man. The Lord of all became a servant. The righteous one made sin. The eternal one tasted death. The risen one now lives in men. Hallelujah. Jesus, the victorious one, now seated. He's coming. Coming again. I don't mean to belittle what we do during Christmas. I love Christmas probably as much as anybody in here. But this year, I, I'm not going to focus on sound. I'm not going to focus on sleigh bells and snow. Not going to focus on wreath or reindeer, Rudolph. The real meaning of Christmas, the true meaning of Christmas, is the hope that you're going to find in this dear child. Amen. The Savior. Santa may be jolly, and he is. Santa Claus is jolly, but Jesus is wonderful. Amen. Santa can't compare. Amen. Frosty the snowman might make you smile, but the Lord Jesus Christ is counsel. Frosty can't do that. Rudolph may have a shiny nose, and he does, young people. Rudolph's got a shiny nose, but Jesus is mighty God. Rudolph's just a reindeer, amen? You may believe that elves live a long time and never grow old, but Jesus is everlasting Father. Alcohol may give you a temporary solace, but Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Eggnog, champagne, and the Budweiser Clydesdale can't give you that, amen? What has been? What is, what will be your priority this Christmas? It ought not be presents. It ought not be food, fellowship. Christmas is Jesus. Amen. And Jesus is one. He's counsel. He's the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, and the Everlasting Father. I've preached a message on that before. And the message was, and I might do it again. The message was entitled, A Name for Every Need. Well, he's, he's, he's got a name for every need in your life. He's wonderful. He's counselor. He's mighty God. He's the Prince of Peace, everlasting Father. Let's worship Him during this Christmas season. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed.